Vladimir Putin's Victory Day parade in Moscow brought no sign that the war in Ukraine is coming to an end. Russia's leader flaunting his power and his weapons and blaming the West for his invasion. But will the West ever deal with him again? A question to Ralf Stegner, Social Democrat member of the German Bundestag, who joins me this week from Berlin. Our aim is not regime change or weakening uh, uh, one or the other country, but getting the war stopped and Putin to put back his troops. But what about Germany's close relations with Moscow? The military equipment it sold to Russia in violation of EU sanctions? The latest push for a settlement from a key German industrialist? And will Germany back Ukraine's insistence on reparations and justice when the war is over? All that and more on Conflict Zone. Ralph Stegner, welcome to Conflict Zone. Good morning. Two days before the invasion of Ukraine, with Russian troops massing on Ukraine's border, you tweeted, neither arms deliveries nor arms races will help because the conflict can't be solved militarily. Do you now accept that view was wrong? It's, it's thanks to those arms deliveries that Ukraine still exists as a sovereign state, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, my assumption that the conflict in the end cannot be solved militarily still holds true. What we didn't know, neither of us, that Putin would invade uh, the Ukraine and uh, with a war like in the last century and with all these war crimes, and we couldn't um, know in advance how bravely the Ukrainians would be able to defend their country. Uh, still, uh, in the end, at some point of time, the problem has to be solved and it won't be solved militarily. Well, could Germany ever accept a situation where Ukraine would lose the war and Russian aggression would triumph on the European continent? Could you accept that? No, nobody uh, wants the Ukraine to lose the war and I think we cannot afford this. Uh, we, we cannot let Putin win with this imperialistic move. Um, but still there's a difference uh, to the question whether one is able to win a war. I mean, there's a Russian aggression, no doubt about it, that has to be stopped. And um, there are different means to support the Ukraine. We do that and we did that economically, financially, politically with humanitarian aid and also with military aid. Well, some of your statements about the Ukrainians have been pretty defeatist in the past. I wonder why that is. You were quoted telling a television program that sending heavy weapons to Ukraine was essentially pointless because the country had no chance of winning. You wouldn't still say that, would you? Well, the point is that military experts, and I'm not a military expert, there are a lot of military experts these days. I'm not one of them. Uh, tell me that without the NATO entering the war, which uh, cannot be uh, at any means uh, the aim of uh, what we're talking about, um, it might be possible that Russia won't uh, get uh, to the point where they want to, but it's very hard to believe that the Ukraine could win a war against Russia with so many more troops than the Ukrainians have and more, many more means. And therefore, uh, I support uh, our government and the policy together with the Allies uh, with what we're doing. I don't think that the only solution is more and more and heavier and heavier arms. And another but it, point but it's has not to the be, right time, uh, is it? It's not the right time, as, as you've put it, to put your faith in diplomacy and sanctions. You said diplomacy and sanctions a week ago. You said this should have priority over weapons. Diplomacy and sanctions haven't had much effect so far, have they? In fact, Ukraine is engaged in a fight for its know. very survival. I don't know whether you, uh, this is true, that the sanctions don't have an effect. I think they will have effects, and they do have effects, and they hurt Russia very much. Uh, and as I said, uh, I also support what we're doing together with the Allies. I'm not, uh, just not convinced, as some others are, that more and more weapons, and even heavier weapons, will uh, decide the war uh, on the Ukrainian side. And uh, I see also see the victims and the destruction of the country and all of that. And uh, to make no mistake, it's the decision of the Ukrainians themselves what they are doing. 
uh, we cannot give them advice and that it's, it's an, independent, an independent country and it's their turn and we try to support them as good as we can. But what is responsible and what is not also includes the question that the war uh, doesn't reach uh, the NATO and that we're not involved in this war. And this also has to be put into account and, and therefore uh, I have, uh, I think it's at least, at least it's a troublesome question one also has the responsibility for uh, not only saying we do everything uh, uh, what is expected uh, from the Ukrainian side. We can't do everything what is expected. They have had some wishes which we couldn't afford uh, to deliver because uh, no flight zones and uh, kind of things because that would have involved NATO and that's a border we cannot and we should not cross. How do you feel about this latest call from German business to call for a settlement? The boss of Volkswagen, Herbert Dies, has caused outrage in Kiev by calling for a negotiated settlement and getting back to opening up the markets again. There wasn't a mention of the war crimes being committed or the crime of aggression, just a warning that Europe will suffer most and Germany if global trade isn't restarted. Are you proud of that? No, I, I mean... There is no doubt, and we're united in the uh, in the question that everybody knows Putin is the aggressor, and he's a war criminal, and he should have been in The Hague uh, someday. Uh, but, but what about this we, intervention we, we from Herbert Dies, for instance? We, I mean, yeah, cities are being flattened, think... thousands are dying, <clears throat> and one of your most prominent industrial magnets is only concerned with his profit margins. Yeah, I don't uh, support that at all, and he's not a social democrat, and uh, I, I, I don't support this at all. We cannot talk about lifting any sanctions or coming back to economic normality before this war stops and Putin uh, puts his troops back, I and mean, there's no doubt about this. But I don't think that has anything to do with the position I'm uh, advocating here. Also, not only seeing the military means, but all the other possibilities we have, because every war has to be... Uh, solved at the end diplomatically, um, and war is the worst that can happen to people. But uh, how long? Because they how lose long, their lives Stegner, and the country long, is destroyed. How long will it be before more influential Germans start pushing for renormalization of ties with Moscow? Memories are short, aren't they? Especially when there's money to be made and and lost. Well, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with our values, and therefore I can only say there is no way. Uh, towards normalization and towards earning money with uh, war, in a war going on that is uh, able to destroy the Ukraine. I mean, that is just a horrible uh, imagination and therefore that doesn't have any support by any democratic uh, party in, in Germany. Maybe the right-wing extremists under, uh, support this, but we don't. Do you think there can be normalization between Europe and Russia while Putin remains in power? Possibly until 2036? Well, first of all, uh, we should not uh, let us lead by our wishes how uh, the governments otherwise uh, should be. Uh, as we see in many parts of the world, we have to do with countries that have governments we don't like at all. And it doesn't look like uh, that Putin uh, gets uh, ousted by his own people, opposition people get murdered or arrested and uh, in jail, and it's a minority. And although one cannot trust the, the, the numbers, still the support for Putin in Russia seems to be pretty high. So I wouldn't count on a change uh, very much. And regime change is not um, a good experience we have as, as, as aim of our policies. So uh, I think we will have to deal with Russia one day or the other. And I'm afraid uh, we are not the ones to decide who's in government there. Yet the precondition for that is that the war is, has come to an end, that Russia puts back its troop, that Ukraine is a democratic, independent state um, and not something which is uh, dictated by a, a Russian uh, czar or however you would want to call him. And, and without reparations and without accountability for the war crimes, you think you can just shake hands and start doing business again with Putin? I mean, isn't the problem that successive German governments seem to have been unable to work out that he does run a state which murders its political opponents? 
Um, and yet no allowance has been made for that in the close relationship that Germany tried to foster over so many years with Putin. If you look at the tens of thousands of people who were killed in Chechnya on Putin's orders, no one sat up and said, what sort of person could do that? I'm wondering why this close relationship went on being forged when it became clear that violence in Russia was part of the official toolkit at street level and state level. That should have led to a very different kind of relationship, shouldn't it? Well, the point is uh, Egon Barr, a very smart former politician and architect of the Ostpolitik of Willy Brandt, once said, if we only dealt with the countries uh, who we share every value with, we would be alone with Norway and Iceland. That will be too, uh, uh, that's not enough. But uh, there are limits, aren't there? Was exaggerated. Aren't there limits? Yes, but uh, what I want, want to tell you is, uh, for instance, uh, Frank Steinmeier, uh, president of uh, Germany and former um, um, minister, uh, negotiated with the Iran and no nuclear uh, treaty with one of the worst, uh, bloodiest dictatorship regimes we know. And still, it's a good thing to do that. And we have uh, regimes we don't like at all in China. There was no, uh, there was no democracy there, and we have even in our own camp. If you look at Turkey, part of NATO, not a democracy, and so uh, many countries uh, don't have democracies, and or we have now um, new economic ties to Ara Ara Arabic states, uh, who uh, sentence many, many people to death, and have nothing to do with our values. So that's part of the sad reality we have that. Uh, we don't have uh, democratic states uh, all over the place. And if you look at the countries that support Russia in this war, or that at least don't uh, share the sanctions we do, then you have a majority of the population of the world, which is really sad, but that's yeah, but, the but, case. You know, Germany, so uh, Germany with along people. with other countries, you, you ignored a lot of warnings that came about what Putin's intentions really were. For good reasons, we thought that it's better to seek economic ties with uh, Russia, scientific uh, cooperation, uh, youth exchange, and all these kind of things, because that was one of the experience we had after the war, that if you strengthen those ties, it makes it less likely that people go to war with each other. And uh, Germany has a lot of responsibility for the worst uh, war we ever had in history, uh, and therefore, I think it's understandable that we try to rather advance diplomatic ties, economic ties, rather than only think in military terms. Yes, and but it didn't, in, this case, in this case, this Wandel durch Handel um, idea, uh, change through trade, didn't stop this brutal aggression with uh, thousands of people being killed and cities decimated. Didn't, didn't work, did it? Doesn't work doesn't change people's behavior. No. You mentioned China. It hasn't changed any behavior in China whatsoever, has it? No, but I think you can see that in all parts of the world that we have brutal crimes and wars and people dying. Sometimes we don't care at all uh, in Africa when there are no resources uh, in the game or where no power interests. Uh, um, you find that, uh, and, and I think that isn't right at all anywhere in the world. My uh, understanding is that the best way would be that the United, Na the United Nations are the ones to decide when you have to help a p uh, country that is uh, uh, attacked uh, by another or has a civil war with uh, a lot of civilian victims. Uh, but the United Nations aren't strong enough, and we still have this old structure with the veto rights that doesn't really work, as we could see uh, in Russia. But that's the best way, rather than uh, one side deciding what to do. And actually, there is no one who should throw the first stone, because um, as the Iraq war shows and other th Afghanistan and other places, um, there are so many things that have gone wrong. Uh, yeah, but the point is to sides. learn lessons from, from the things that went wrong, isn't it? America, America wants to see Russia permanently weakened after this war. Do you? Um, I don't think that this is the position of the American president. Uh, we heard what's the... Uh, Minister of Defense in Washington said, but um, there are talks between the governments, especially between uh, bon uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz and President Biden and President Macron, and we understand that the aims haven't, be, haven't been reviewed. Our aim is not regime change or weakening uh, uh, one or the other country, 
but getting the war stopped and Putin to put back his troops and uh, reassuring the sovereignty of uh, a democratic Ukraine. Herr Stegner, do you believe that one of the biggest mistakes of the past was pushing ahead with that big symbol of good relations between Russia and Germany, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, right up until this project was halted at the very last moment? Um, is it any wonder that Russia got the message that Germany didn't care about Ukraine because this, it was full speed ahead with Nord Stream 2 um, after the invasion of Crimea? But you still went along with it. Germany was warned repeatedly about putting an energy weapon into Russia's hands, especially by the U.S. and the East European states. Why were those warnings ignored? Well, first of all, uh, that uh, it was a uh, mistake to make us so dependent on Russian gas has been said uh, by the German president, by the chancellor, in his speech in the Bundestag, in his Zeitenwende speech, other than by others who still uh, are criti uh, do criticism, criticize that in, in the public. And second, uh, still there have been good reasons at that time for that, although it was wrong in the, uh, in the side from today, but there were good reasons. One reason is Germany is a country with a lot of nuclear and coal power, and for the uh, change we have to make, we needed uh, cheap gas, and uh, cheaper and more in friendly to the environment than the, than the uh, American fracking gas. Herr Stegner, since 2014, Germany and some other EU states have been exploiting a loophole in the EU sanctions on Russia and directly selling Moscow military equipment, including rifles, so-called protection vehicles. Are you happy about that? I'm very critical in t uh, as far as uh, exports of military uh, products are concerned in uh, regions of tension or dictatorships. Um, I have a very strong opinion on that, have had for many, many years. Not always um, uh, um, was that view shared by everybody um, who is in responsibility in, uh, in Germany, but that was always my position that we should not uh, uh, send arms um, and weapons in regions of tension and to dictatorships. And there are very few exceptions. We have an obligation towards Israel uh, that is different from everything else. Uh, but uh, well, there are, there are I, actually I quite a few exceptions, counts. aren't there? Because, you know, successive German governments have been using this tired and false excuse that Germany doesn't send weapons to conflict zones when all the experts know that it does. The largest recipient of German arms has been Egypt, six billion euros worth over the last four years. Egypt fully involved in the Yemen and Libyan wars as well as human rights abuses You're at right. home. You're right and I don't uh, re uh, object to that at all and I criticize that too knowing that uh, we are part of the problem uh, our government has been, and I'm, I'm, a I'm a critic of that. I think this is wrong. The issue of sending heavy weapons to Ukraine has been highly controversial in Germany. It split the government, it split your party, it split the country. But for a long time, Chancellor Scholz just couldn't make up his mind, could he? He kept saying Germany wouldn't go it alone. The fact is nobody ever asked Germany to go it alone. By the time Berlin said yes to heavy weapons, its allies had been shipping arms to Ukraine for weeks. What was Scholz afraid of? The pacifist wing in your party? It's still pretty strong, isn't it? No, I don't think this, uh, this is true, and I think that's a very uh, superficial impression uh, I can uh, observe by, by others who criticize that. If you talk to the people on the streets, they uh, uh, know and they are uh, glad that we have a chancellor that who, in questions of uh, war and peace, is uh, cautious, is, uh, uh, rethinks things, uh, acts uh, very closely together, with uh, especially Washington and Paris, and also one who doesn't look at the uh, so much at the communication part of it, with the strong interviews and all those guys who do that, uh, uh, gladly are not in uh, the chancellor's place. And people know that, and uh, they like that, and therefore, my impression about what our people think about this uh, is totally different from what I uh, hear. And besides, well, you, sometimes you say I that, but see okay. myself. Yeah, but you say that, but according to so, the polling institute INSA on May the 1st, 54% yeah. of Germans are unhappy with oh, Schultz's performance. Nah, 
the poles are this way and that way. And I see in many things that what is uh, talked about in the public and what happens really is the difference. Let me give you another other example. I'm part of the uh, Foreign uh, Relations Committee in the German Bundestag, so I've been able to look at the lists of things we um, export to the Ukraine. And I've seen many times that what I read in those lists was different from what was reported in the public. And besides that we have good reasons not to talk about what we do exactly, besides the French are much more strict than we are. They didn't talk at all about what they are doing. We do that uh, partly anyway. Uh, so I'm not so uh, surprised about how the public discusses this. I can only say that people much more like to see uh, Olaf Scholz uh, in the chancellery as who, uh, someone who is responsible for what he's doing, trying to support the Ukraine as good as we can and, and also make sure that Germany and NATO doesn't get part of the war. Uh, and, and what about his diplomatic his spat? What about his diplomatic spat with, with uh, Ukraine? Just because President Zelensky criticized your president's previous close relationship with Moscow and said he shouldn't visit, Schultz decided he wouldn't go either. Shouldn't the government have been able to rise above petty squabbles in the middle of a major war in Europe? Uh, well, it's very difficult to criticize the Ukrainian president or the ambassador to Germany in a situation where they defend their country. Yet on the other side, it has been the first time since World War II that our head of state has been, been named persona non grata in another country. And, and, and by the way, Germany is the country that supported the Ukraine economically, humanitarian, financially, more than any other country in Europe for a long time. Uh, and also does this in, uh, together with the others. So that is not something you can just uh, ignore and if the president ca cannot come, uh, the chancellor could not just go to Kiev as if there was nothing. Now, this was resolved, and it's good that it was resolved, and we should not have uh, discussions about interior policies with the ambassador. That's not his business, and that's not the way we do things. Uh, yet, I know there's nothing to win in seeking conflict with uh, representatives of the Ukrainian state. We don't want to have this because it leads away from what we are trying to do together with our allies supporting the Ukraine as best as we can and what is affordable, what works, uh, what is, makes sense and what doesn't bring us uh, into the war as uh, part of this war uh, ourselves. Herr Stegner, everybody knows now that um, everybody who lives in Western and Eastern Europe knows that they're living next to a dangerously unpredictable superpower on their eastern flank and a leader who has no qualms about using force to get what he wants. Do you have faith that the NATO alliance can defend itself against this Russia, Putin's Russia? Well, I'm sure we can and we will if NATO uh, was attacked, but everybody can only hope that this never happens because uh, the power of destruction, if you look at the nuclear arsenals of both sides, um, is just terrible. And yet there's always place uh, for smart leaders and for good diplomacy, uh, as you could have seen in the Cuban Missile Crisis with President Kennedy, different uh, circumstances, yet very smart and a president who didn't act as the public wanted him to do and all newspapers wrote and the military establishment and the economic and the political establishment. He refused that and basically that was the reason why we didn't have World War III, I would say. But, and, but smart uh, diplomacy, it's, uh, smart it's diplomacy today. you talk about, smart diplomacy is not a substitute for reparations and accountability. Is Germany going to insist on that in any peace deal that is agreed with Russia now? Well, it's clear that there cannot be, it can only be a solution when the Ukraine agrees to it. Ukraine is a sovereign state and we cannot act uh, in, uh, for the Ukrainians, it's, it's their business, and we should, uh, we should not do that. I mean, that would be very arrogant. They have to decide what they want to do, and we have to decide how we can support them, as good as we can. And you will support them whatever that, they insist there are possibilities. on, will you? You will support them whatever they insist no. on? No, that would, no, that would be, that would be uh, irresponsible, because, uh, of course, we are responsible for what we are doing. And as Olaf Scholz said, and besides, that's exactly what the opinion is of President Biden and also President Macron. Uh, 
that NATO doesn't want to get involved in this war directly. Uh, that is the position everybody shares, and I really want to stress that because uh, sometimes uh, I have the impression people uh, think that it's Germany who holds uh, and prevents things from happening. That's not the case. We work together, uh, and uh, obviously it has to be explained a little bit better in, in the public, that may be. Uh, yet uh, I think we uh, are in good agreement with our allies, and that should stay that way for everything we're doing in the future. And if Ukraine insists on reparations and accountability, you will support those demands, will you? Well, one can only support things one knows how they are exactly. Uh, you cannot say that it's without It's not an important principle be, to you. That, that, that we have an obligation to uh, seek that the Ukraine gets restored, and I mean that this uh, massive destruction, um, that the Ukraine can come back to a normal life, that's our interest and that's our obligation, I would say, yes. Ralph Stegner, it's good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.